Hi everyone. Just before we get into the maths and physics of this particular video, a few words on study strategy for the quantum world. So I've mentioned this at the start of a couple of the engagement in-person sessions, but let's also hammer it home via the medium of YouTube. So the best way to study this module, I would say, would be start with the notes. Read the notes. Play with the interactive simulations, the interactive figures, try to build an understanding and develop your understanding that way too. Try the worksheets, try the problems on the worksheets. If that's not working, go back to the notes, go back to the interactive simulations and figures, see if you can figure things out. Still not working, go to the videos. If the videos don't help, and don't sort of give you that little bit more understanding, which I hope they will, but if they don't, then please get in touch. Obviously, I know you're coming along to all those engagement sessions at nine o'clock on Monday mornings. So talk to me after those as well, or send me an email and we can arrange to meet up. Okay, with that said, let's, um, just a few words on wave packets. Well, it'll be maybe 10 minutes or so, 10 or 15 minutes on wave packets, more than a few words. Um, so we've seen that plane waves of this form Are not a physically acceptable wave function. Let's just consider the spatial part of that and let's say we've got a well-defined um, spatial frequency, let's call that k0, and that's that a function of that type we are going to use to represent our wave function for a quantum mechanical particle or quantum mechanical system. The issue with this, well, we know is twofold. First of all, that if we take the complex conjugate of this, multiply it by the function itself, so we get the modulus squared, then we get a constant. We integrate that constant, which in this case will be 1, across all space, we get an integral that diverges. So it's not a physically acceptable wave function. Moreover, it's a constant across all space, therefore we have complete and utter absolute uncertainty as to the position of the particle. So a plane wave does not make a good choice to represent a localized object, like a quantum mechanical particle, which of course are all yellow. Um, so, two key reasons why this type of plane wave um, suggestion for a wave function is, is not a good representation of what's going on. You might then say, as students asked me last year, well, why the hell do we use them? Why do we introduce them? Well, much like we start off in terms of new Newtonian mechanics with completely... Um, how can I put it, idealized systems in terms of frictionless um, surfaces, in terms of no air resistance, etc., which, you know, those type of systems are not what we have in the, in the world around us. Starting with plane waves and thinking about plane waves and their Fourier transform in terms of infinitely sharp uh, Fourier spectra is important because it's building our understanding and moreover, this is the key point, although plane waves themselves aren't physically acceptable wave um, functions, combinations of plane waves in just the right way, via the appropriate Fourier integral, do allow us to represent functions um, that are spatially localized in space. So you've already seen on worksheet two, question four, you've already considered a top hat function. So a, a wave function that looks like this, or a function that looks like this, which has got some, that's meant to be the center, I don't think that's quite the center, let's say it's there, and it's got some weight, and let's call that width delta x. And you've seen that if you Fourier transform that, to get its, its representation in terms of spatial frequency, then what you get is a sync function. And that's k on that axis. Hope you can see that. So, top hat, Fourier transforms to a sync function. And then if you get, take the modulus squared of this, so this is a real function, you'll get a sync squared function. So, that's getting us somewhere in that we've got a localized wave function describing a particle. We know that we can make up this localized wave function in terms of plane waves added together according to the spectrum we have, the Fourier spectrum we have, which tells us just how much of each of those plane waves we need. However, this again 
is not a physically realistic wave function because of these discontinuities. It abruptly, infinitely abruptly, goes from 1 to 0 or whatever value you have here to, to, to 0. Cuts off directly. A much more physically realistic um, wave packet would be something that doesn't have that sharp cutoff and indeed is something that is a Gaussian function. It's got a Gaussian form. Why a Gaussian? Well, there are a number of different reasons. First of all, it's integrable in that if we take the modulus squared of this thing, integrate, we do, we can normalize it. We can set our probability density, or integrate a probability density, i.e. our probability to one, um, which is great. Uh, moreover, in terms of Gaussian functions, they are absolutely central, of course, to probability theory. And given that probability also plays a central role in quantum mechanics, it shouldn't perhaps be too surprising that Gaussian functions um, appear with a great deal of regularity. So if we take the Fourier transform of that, and this is another wonderful thing about Gaussians, so the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. So the Fourier transform from one Gaussian, we get another Gaussian. And the widths, as you might expect at this stage, are reciprocally related. So if we narrow our Gaussian in terms of x, so we make our delta x smaller, or delta k, i.e. our delta p, because p is equal to h bar k, becomes wider. That's the uncertainty principle. Notice I haven't mentioned measurement. Notice I haven't mentioned disturbance. Nothing along those lines. What we're talking about in terms of Heisenberg uncertainty is the, the pure innate mathematical physics underpinning waves. It's in many ways classical physics because it's Fourier analysis. You squeeze something in time, you broaden it in frequency. You squeeze something in space, you broaden it in spatial frequency. That's, that's the essence of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We will, of course, see in upcoming videos very soon that measurement does, of course, disturb the system, though not always. Sometimes you can make a measurement and you can know with absolute 100% certainty what the result of that measurement is going to be in quantum mechanics. We'll discuss this. But in general, measurement does disturb the system in a strange way that we still don't fully understand. We can predict what's going to go on in terms of the probabilities of what's going to happen. We can make very good um, predictions of those probabilities. Excellent predictions of those pro probabilities. But um, in terms of exactly why it's happening as it's happening, that's still an unanswered question in quantum mechanics. But for now, we have a particle. Now we've got it described in terms of a localized wave function. And all those popular accounts of, um, I'll pick up the ball again, the yellow particle. Many, many, many popular accounts of quantum mechanics, um, popular science accounts of quantum mechanics, all is painted in terms of this dichotomy between, well, we've got particles, localized objects on one side, and on the other side, we've got these delocalized waves. How can we ever bring them together? And of course, you know now how we can bring them together. We just need to add up those delocalized waves in the right way to create a localized object. So, Fourier transform of a Gaussian is another Gaussian. Okay, so let's write down mathematically what is our description of our, our wave function, this Gaussian wave function. So, we could write that a number of ways, different ways we can write it, but let's pick one of the simplest. We have some normalization constant. Don't get too hung up on this just yet. In worksheet four, you're going to calculate what the, work, what the value of that normalization constant should be, but don't worry about it just yet. And then we have something which is looks like this, which should hopefully ring some bells, where we've got Gaussian centered at x0, this would be our mean value if we were talking about a probability distribution, and we indeed are talking about a probability distribution if we were to square this. Um, uh, and the sigma represents the, is a parameter that controls the width of uh, the wave function and therefore the width of the probability density, which would be the square of this. Notice it's real. 
So when we take this, multiply it by its complex conjugate, and I multiply it by, um, get the modulus squared, then in this case, because this is a real function, then we are just going to end up with just the square of this function. The um, complex conjugate of a real function is the function itself. But this is just the, um, the spatial part. We are going to be interested in just how this evolves in time as well. So let's just be clear. This represents spatial part at time is equal to zero. What we're going to do in the next video is we are going to take the time dependent Schrodinger equation We're going to take this as our starting condition, our starting state, and we're going to evolve this state according to the time dependent Schrodinger equation. We're going to do that on a computer, simulation to show you what happens. It's fascinating as to what happens. And you don't, it's why I keep coming back to these simulations, these interactive figures. There are static figures, obviously, in the notes, of course, but you don't really get a good handle on how this system is evolving until you start to play with those interactive simulations. Links down there. Um, Notice, in particular, although this thing starts off as real, when we have the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, we have the imaginary number, we have i, built into the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So this starts off as purely real, but as it evolves, there's an imaginary contribution there. And those real and imaginary contributions both play a key role in terms of how the system evolves. You're going to see that in more detail in the next video and well beyond in terms of everything else we do in the quantum world. Right, so that's our wave function. We're going to see how it evolves in the next video, but just to um, hammer this home, we take the Fourier transform um, of that Gaussian wave function. What we get is another Gaussian. And we get a Gaussian, this is purely real, we get a Gaussian that is centered at k is equal to zero. You will calculate this Fourier transform for yourself in um, worksheet four, as I mentioned. And although it doesn't look, quite look symmetric here, this should be a symmetric Gaussian, which means that in terms of the plane waves that we need to sum up, um, to form this uh, wave function, there's as many with positive values of k as there are with negative values of k. That means there is no net momentum. That this, the mean position of this wave packet is, is fixed in space. That doesn't mean it doesn't change with time. It does, as you'll see in the next video. But it doesn't move. Its, it's mean position stays fixed in space because it must, because there's in terms of the component waves that make it up, there's as many positive values as there are negative values, so its net momentum is zero. How do we give it a kick? How do we get it moving? How, does it, um, how do we give it a velocity? Then what we need to do is multiply this wave function by something which has got a net momentum. What has got a net momentum? A plane wave. So we would take this wave function This and multiply it by something which has a given value of spatial frequency, k0, which means it's got a given value of momentum, or a net value of momentum, p is equal to h bar k0. Play around with those simulations below and just see what influence this value of k0 has on the, um, the wave function, because now it's got a net momentum, and now it will move, its mean position will move. So we've now got a way of representing a localized particle, and not only a localized particle, but a localized particle that's moving. So what we have is a plane wave, so something that oscillates, this will be cos k0x plus i sine zero x, k0x, so we've got something that oscillates modulated by the Gaussian function. Let's do it. Let's do a plane wave, oh, let's do a big, like this. And what we have is that, if we'll just consider, let's just consider the real part, multiplied by our Gaussian. And so let's 
put a Gaussian like this. So what we have, that's broadly Gaussian. So if we take the product of those two things, which is what this is, then what we'll end up with is something that looks like, just considering the real part, plane wave modulated by a Gaussian, so this envelope is Gaussian, this overall envelope that describes the function, describes the, the variation in the amplitude of the plane wave, is Gaussian. That's what those simulations are going to show you. Make sure you understand those simulations. Um, we're going to be thinking about wave packets a lot over the course of the next few uh, videos. Um, we're also going to be coming back to wave packets many times um, because we need a way of representing localized particles. Um, and we need something that's normalizable and we need physically realistic wave functions, etc, etc, etc. So wave packets are a key aspect of quantum mechanics. Moreover, when it comes to things like quantum mechanical tunneling, when it comes to scattering from different potentials, how do quantum waves scatter from um, different potentials, really getting a good handle on wave packets is, is very much the way forward. Okay, onwards and upwards. Next video is about just how these wave packets evolve in time. Some really interesting stuff happens. See you in the next video. Bye.